Thank you everybody for joining. So excited to be here for our State of Marketing Measurement webinar. We have a fantastic panel today and lots of great data and insights to get to. Uh, so let's kick it off. First, just wanna highlight, this is an interactive webinar. If you want to participate in Q&A uh, and our polls, please go to slido.com and enter the code 299-7903. We will show this code again, uh, but highly encouraged for everybody to be able to participate today. We are thrilled to have marketers from three rapidly growing consumer brands on our panel. First, inspired by the sun, Therity is a family brand all about great quality, legendary comfort, and good vibes. They are fueled by purpose and leaving the world better than they found it. And the brand now has 40 stores across the United States. Viori takes a new perspective on performance apparel, drawing inspiration from an active California lifestyle and integration of fitness, yoga, surf, and life. Since they started in San Diego, they have opened more than 20 retail stores across the U.S. and have recently opened their first international store in London in September. Last but not least, uh, recently achieving a major milestone, 4Ocean has pulled over 25 million pounds of plastic from the ocean this year. The brand sells bracelets and other items made out of these recycled materials and has grown rapidly in recent years. Now let's meet the panel behind our uh, wonderful brands. Alex Faraday, CEO of Faraday Brands. Welcome, Alex. Thanks for having me. And Stephanie Bregman, VP of Marketing from 4Ocean. Welcome, Stephanie. Thanks for having me as well. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. And Stephen Johnson, Director of Performance Marketing from Viore Clothing. Welcome, Stephen. Thanks. Stoked to be here. And additionally, we have Terrence Einhorn, our solutions engineer from Measured. He will be helping to field questions from the slido.com Q&A section. And my name is Clay Cohen. I'm director of product marketing here at Measured. We are a media intelligence platform that helps brands optimize their marketing spend using incrementality-based attribution. All right, let's kick it off. Today, we will be reviewing data from our recent State of DTC Marketing Measurement Report. Uh, we were very grateful to partner with Sequent Partners to survey 300 D2C marketers in the US. Uh, as you can see, we have a wide range of industries and job levels represented. If you have not received or downloaded the report yet, you can do so at measure.com slash resources. All right. Let's jump right in today. We're going to start with some trends and insights around spend and allocation. Uh, first, we're going to kick this off with a live poll on slido.com. You can use your phone to snap that QR code if you haven't already. Um, otherwise, you can go to slido.com and enter 2997903. And we've got our first answer in there. We'll Hang out for a sec, let people join if they haven't already. All right, about an even split coming in. This is kind of fun having it come in live. And we'll probably give it another 10, 15 seconds. And note, if you are watching live on LinkedIn, there is about a five to 10 second delay. So try and get your answers in quickly for the polls uh, as we may move ahead before uh, a little earlier for you. All right. Wow. 40% on Facebook and Instagram coming in. I think we have a pretty clear lead here so we can jump on ahead. Uh, thank you for everybody for participating in the poll. Um, based on our research report, and not surprising, Google and Facebook still dominating uh, D2C uh, share of spend. Um, as you can see here, Facebook and Instagram at 29%. If you put YouTube and Google together, you end up a little higher than that. Um, and then interestingly, not too far behind linear TV. This actually includes local and national. Uh, you'll notice in our report, if you download it, these categories are actually broken out a little more specifically. Let's turn this over uh, to our first question to our panel. Uh, Stephanie, are you surprised to see these results? And uh, why do you think linear TV is so much higher than CTV? I feel like we hear a lot about yeah. CTV these days. 
I'm not surprised by this at all. <clears throat> I mean, Facebook and Google are always going to be a big piece of the pie, uh, no matter what, uh, because of the intent and the fact that we are digital first with most e-commerce stores. Uh, linear television, though, I think has made a huge comeback because of the fact, I mean, linear te television has always been around, but I think a lot of smaller businesses are starting to implement linear TV as one of their strategies because of the higher cost of digital. Uh, and so I would say that the reason I believe linear uh, and, and CTV are, are probably showing to be so different, CTV typically, uh, I'll, I'll start off with linear. On the linear side, we're seeing that people are typically buying a lot of remnant inventory, so they're able to keep their costs down. So that's probably the first piece of the puzzle. So you can actually buy in mass and get really low costs per visitor. Um, when you're starting to buy more into like a CTV, there's only so much inventory that you can technically buy. Linear is it's a much bigger space. So typically it's, it's, it's usually a lot of times more expensive because typically you're trying to go towards specific audiences and segmenting appropriately. When you're doing remnant, you're buying everything. And so you can keep your costs down. And so I think people are looking at linear as just a really uh, amazing prospecting tool to get people into top of funnel when they feel like they have not been able to really hit the threshold or that, or that they have hit the threshold for how much they can gather on the Facebook you know, prospecting side. Uh, so typically I see a lot of companies, they'll do that. They'll start heavily on Facebook and Google and they'll say, I, I can't scale anymore. I can't get my prospecting to get beyond this point without losing enough efficiency. And they'll look for other tools. And, and Linear TV has been really great. I've worked doing uh, television with uh, two other brands now. And so I think it's just a really great option as another tool for getting prospecting uh, to get to the next, get to that next level. Um, so awesome. yeah. Great. Thank you for that. Um, any other comments from Alex or Steven on, on TV in general? Do you guys have any experience there or um, kind of history there? Alex, any thoughts? Um, yeah, we 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 have uh, made it a part of our of our marketing stack, and I think it's I think Stephanie nailed it as far as top funnel. And I think the other thing is what we're really working through there is like how does the creative really stand out? Um, because you have a moment of time where you actually have to kind of watch the commercial, which is on Instagram and Facebook, you don't. Mm. So um, putting more thought and investment into making sure that the creative is a next level to what we would do on Facebook and Instagram. Awesome. Thank you for that. And that's actually a really great point that we'll touch on a little bit later about kind of thinking about how the user is absorbing content and taking that into a, into effect, um, you know, when we plan out our budgets and, and where we're trying to reach them. So thank you for that. Awesome. So now that we know where brands are spending their media budgets, um, you know, Facebook and Google still still very high on that list. Let's take a look at how they measure the performance of that media. So based on our D2C report, 80% of D2C brands are still reliant on click-based attribution methods for evaluating their performance. So what do we mean when we say click-based attribution? For the purposes of today's discussion, um, click-based attribution is referring to platform attribution, so Lyft-type studies or Lyft-based studies, um, platform reporting direct from those platforms, um, additionally, site-site analytics like Google Analytics, and uh, even multi-touch attribution or other forms of attribution. Um, so Alex, question for you. Our survey respondents um, were asked, what is their primary form of measurement, which is the results that we're seeing here? Um, one, do these numbers surprise you? And two, can we assume that most brands are actually using more than one method uh, to measure the performance of their media? Yeah, I think for sure. I think especially now that more and more uh, has come out around platform attribution, and the difficulties of taking it word for word. Um, I think it's now pretty much everyone knows that who's a marketer, um, especially over the last year. Mm -hmm. So we're all using different things to get to you know, one source of truth. And um, I think the goal here is how do you make this more efficient because it, we're all spending a lot of time on it. Right, yeah, absolutely. Stephanie, you look like you had a yeah. note there. No, it's just funny because like from, from a marketer perspective, we are always trying to make sure that our CEOs trust in the judgment that we have to know what is performing. And I think to, um, you know, to Alex's point, I totally agree with him. And I think that 
we are we have to always try to make sure that we can come intelligently and talk about how we are performing and become more predictable and how can we be predictable if we're relying on Facebook and for Google to grade their own homework, which we obviously know doesn't work. So it always scares me a little bit when I find companies are using the platform attribution as their sole source of truth. It always worries me a little bit, but it also is a really cool opportunity to get better. And so, um, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's interesting. I think that this study is really interesting for me to see other perspectives, but I definitely think we have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. um, to make sure that we can be more predictable and be more accurate with the kind of forecasting that we're uh, we're providing. Right. No, that's a great point. And I think yeah. um, taking that to another level in terms of accuracy, it's important for us to kind of evaluate. Uh, you know, what is the challenge specifically with these types of attribution, and what what is changing in our industry right now? Uh, leads us to our next point here, talking about how this type of attribution is affected. Um, Stephen, would you mind sharing with us a little bit about kind of what's happening here uh, and, and what are the challenges that click-based attribu attribution methods are facing, um, you know, as marketers try to use them today? Yeah, for sure. So the biggest one that everybody's talking about is Apple's ATT prompt. It's been around for a little while now. And some some platforms, specifically Facebook, have taken a hit from it. But like one thing that's important to note, like even before any of these changes happened, like even if you had a, a crystal ball to see every interaction a user had throughout their journey, it doesn't tell you what caused them to purchase. And so you don't know if they would have purchased anyway. So it's important to note that like correlation does not equal causation. And so incrementality measurement is key pre pre these updates and post these updates. Awesome. Thank you. No, that's a great point. So there's these kind of data regulations that are happening that are affecting the ability of these platforms to see enough data. But then there's this whole other concept around click-based attribution, really just highlighting correlation. Someone purchased this ad, or sorry, someone purchased this product after seeing this ad. So we're going to take credit for that uh, because we were in the pipeline. Doesn't necessarily reveal a causal relationship between did the ad actually cause someone to make that purchase? And definitely true incrementality helps us reveal that. Just also want to highlight one of the challenges here as these uh, types of attribution are utilized by marketers, they do tend to take credit for the same uh, conversion. So if you look at all the different conversions added up across your different media platforms, it's very rare that it will ever actually reconcile with the amount of transactions you see in your system of record. So thank you for noting that. And I also just want to highlight, in case anyone hasn't read it, Facebook Meta took out a, a whole uh, full page article in the drum not too long ago, basically highlighting, yep, we can no longer really accurately measure uh, the amount of conversions that we, uh, you know, can take credit for uh, because of a, a lot of data loss. And we'll kind of explore that now uh, in a deeper example. So to demonstrate this effect of how does any kind of major event or privacy change or data uh, regulate, regulation affect uh, these particular platform's ability to measure performance. So let's look at some data that measured is pulled from the iOS 14.5 change. In the pre-iOS 14.5 uh, world, Facebook had access to more conversion data. Uh, this enabled them to more easily take credit for sales that took place after a user saw a Facebook ad. As Facebook's look back window shrank post iOS 14.5, they then had a more limited view into how many conversions were happening after a user saw that ad. Um, as in this example, we're looking at CPA. Um, as CPA is an equation of conversions and spend, the reported cost of these conversions then increased uh, on Facebook. Taking this at face value, a brand may have been inclined to reduce their spend as the media seemed less efficient. Now, incrementality tests don't rely on user tracking. Instead, we're able to test the true causal impact of the media by performing a holdout test, for example. As it turns out, and as many marketers, I think, suspected in their gut, the media didn't suddenly become uh, less effective. It was just being underreported as such by Facebook because they had access to less data there were still just as many incremental conversions happening um, as marketers continued to spend money there. 
Uh, it's important to note that this was especially true for upper funnel channels, where the point of conversion is frequently much further outside of this new look back window. Inversely, lower funnel media was slightly less affected as those conversions more frequently happen within that shorter look back window. Now, this leads us to the more important question, which we guessed uh, get asked all the time, which is how far off is the data actually? Like how inaccurate is it? And how can we think about that? Well, we can use incrementality values to calibrate platform reporting. Incrementality is the percentage of platform reported conversions that were actually caused by the media. It is dynamic. It's different for every brand. It does change week over week. But here we see an example for the week ending October 2nd. Um, this is a median uh, value from across the measured portfolio. As we can see here, uh, Facebook should really only get credit for about 66% of their reported conversions on Facebook prospecting. Uh, similarly here, we can see Google branded search should only get credit uh, for about 13% or 19% here uh, of their reported conversions. Now, you might look at this chart and think, man, email's really bad. Uh, that's not really the case. Incrementality by itself is not good or bad. It's just a measure of the platform's ability to accurately count its true conversion rate. We have to apply incrementality to a business metric to get a better understanding of its value. So here we have another data set applying incrementality to ROAS. Um, this is taken again across the measure portfolio of brands. These are median values as not every brand uses each channel, but for the common channels, you can safely assume this is representative of the majority of brands in our portfolio. Um, as we can see, Google non-branded search comes in relatively close to what was reported by that platform. Um, Facebook prospecting, not too bad, but Facebook retargeting, driving a lot fewer incremental sales uh, than you might think if you were taking the data purely from the Facebook platform. So let's take a question to the panel and kind of discuss this. Um, Alex, we'll start with you. Has incrementality surprised you or confirmed any suspicions that you had on any channels in particular um, or helped kind of shape or change your strategy uh, in any particular channels? Yes. Um, so we were, um, we were, I think, beta users of Measured. So we were one of the OGs to, um, to sign up and it was very helpful because that was probably 2018 when I think the idea of incrementality was was like somewhat nascent and we were pretty young in our journey as marketers so for example catalog was like one of our first big channels we started doing it in 2015 and we sort of took what our catalog agency gave us as the gospel and looking back obviously that was not the right thing to do so we we over invested in catalog mm. for a little bit of time and then we brought measured on really helped us understand the incrementality of the catalog prospect um you know understanding specifically as you have facebook and instagram and google and catalog understanding incrementality so it definitely allowed us to um to shift spend um and i think we've always been overly uh impressed by how um by how incremental Facebook, Facebook and Instagram prospecting are. Mm. Um, so as much as that channel's gotten uh, a little bit of a black eye, um, mm. it's still really good from an incrementality perspective. And we keep testing it. I've been doing this with you guys for five years now, and it's still it's still impressive, which you see on the on the previous slide. Awesome. Thanks for that. That's great insight. You bring up that really good point that we mentioned earlier around upper funnel channels versus lower funnel channels, typically having kind of an inverse relationship from an incremental perspective where on paper, you know, I think a lot of brands come to measure it having worked with an agency that may suggest, okay, let's, you know, optimize towards these lower funnel channels because they look really good from a, from a platform ROAS perspective. But in our guts as marketers, I think, and Stephanie, it looks like you're ready to comment on this. Maybe we know that upper funnel media really is kind of extremely important in growing our, our, our pool of potential customers, but oftentimes really hard to measure uh, from a platform perspective. Any thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, to the previous uh, uh, slide that you were on, it's interesting because when we started testing Facebook and Google, we saw 
everyone keeps saying, well, Facebook, you know, could be underreporting and all this other. We saw the opposite. Like Facebook was not giving themselves enough credit. And so we were seeing like two, 300% incrementality in some of these Google and Facebook channels. So we were like, wait a second, you know, we've been telling our buyers to hit these specific ROAS targets and we are losing all this opportunity when we should really be pacing it down and understanding that we can hit a lower ROAS target, open up that funnel, that prospecting funnel a little bit more. Um, and so that was really interesting for us. Um, the other one was Pinterest. Um, the last brand that I was working with was in the wedding space and we were running Pinterest and Pinterest is not like a click-based type of uh, tool. And so I think that Pinterest a lot of times is very underrated as a platform. And because we're in the wedding space, my, you know, like your gut says like, this has got to work well for us. And so after running incrementality tests for Pinterest, our other attribution tool that we were using at the time was heavily underreporting Pinterest. And we started measuring, when we started doing the test with measured, it allowed us to see, wait a second, it actually is doing really well. It's because people are pinning, they're not necessarily clicking on it right away. We're losing that attribution and they're building their wedding dream and then eventually buying product later or coming there directly and losing that connection. And so there's so many different ways that we can look at it, but I would say those are three of the highlights is how we've seen Facebook, Google, and Pinterest and how we've changed our strategy based off of these tests. That's a great point. And you did highlight that, you know, for each brand, incrementality results can be different. Uh, seasonality is a big impact uh, driver there. Uh, potentially your industry, your average order value, the consideration cycle. Does it take someone on average 30 days to purchase your product versus two days to purchase your product? All of those can impact how kind of accurately the platforms can actually measure their performance. So thank you for sharing. That's a great point. Um, Stephen, any channels in particular in, uh, kind of interesting to, to you or did increment has incrementality revealed anything um, surprising or not surprising to Viore? Yeah, so we're still relatively new with Measured, haven't run a ton of tests yet, but um, brand search was pretty in line with expectations. Like the, the intent of the people that are searching for your brand is, is pretty high. So it, it kind of met our expectations. Don't really have too much to share about anything else. Got it. So so just to reiterate what you're saying, brand search not being incremental is kind of something you expected to happen, although it's hard to prove that um, just taking data at face value. Is that kind of what you meant? Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Yeah, we do see that with a lot of brands. Um, not surprised that, that brand search isn't quite as incremental as expected. Awesome. All right, let's keep moving along here. We're going to jump into data and reporting, and we're going to kick it off with another audience poll. So get your Slido ready, and we will see the results start coming in. The question is, how many hours a week do you spend building or analyzing reports? Um, it's, it's a good question because we were expecting a high number, and we, and we definitely got some high numbers in our data. We'll share that in a second. All right, 17 to 24 hours, nine to 16, four to eight. All right, we'll give it another 10 seconds or so to see, uh, see the results come in. Okay, thank you for everybody, uh, to everybody who participated in our poll. Uh, four to eight hours seems to be uh, the most common amount of time spent reporting for those on our panel. Let's see what the result was from our survey. 64% um, of marketers spent more than nine hours a week uh, on average reporting. This was a director level and up uh, survey. Uh, we did find, and there's some more detailed results in the actual survey result uh, booklet itself, if you download that, as role kind of increased towards the executive level, we did find hours spent reporting also tended to increase a little bit. Um, Stephanie, does this resonate with you? Where do you kind of fall in this in this category? Yeah, I'm probably close to, I'm in between a couple categories. It depends on my week, but I would say between like the 15 to 20 hour mark because I do spend a good portion of my day not doing reports as much because I feel like I have the tools to see things I need to see, but also just like validating, right? So you're always just looking at the channels, making sure you understand what's working, not only from like a standpoint of like, you know, what's working from an ad standpoint, but also looking at the creative as well, look going through making sure that you understand the creative portion. But I also think that reporting also has to do with how many people do you have on your team that can also help with that. So the more slim your team is, sometimes the higher up, the more reporting functionality you may be responsible for, because you want to make sure that 
all the pieces of the puzzle kind of fit together and the message all comes together. So uh, I've worked at companies where it's less and I've worked where it's more, but depending on if I have a uh, growth ahead of growth, if I have someone who's internal buyers who are doing some of this reporting. So I think it really just depends. There's no right or wrong. I think the goal is, is to try to be as efficient as you can uh, as you're reporting. So you're not spending time doing things that you don't need to be doing. So you could spend time growing the business. So great. Yeah. Thank you for that. Great point. Alex, would you mind sharing a little bit about, you know, how much time do you spend just aggregating data, reporting? Like, is it your whole life? Is it, have you, have you been able to trim it down a little bit? Uh, yeah, I guess I'm in the uh, the beneficial spot of having a team. So kudos <laughs> to my peoples. Um, I spend about one hour a week. Um, I mean, obviously over time, we figured out what, what matters and what dashboards matter. Um, so for me, an hour just kind of, seeing everything of how mainly it's for me the connection between performance and creative is mm -hmm. really where i spend my time and then um you know i think having a having a i'm not in the i'm not in the weeds every day so kind of taking a bigger picture approach to what are we actually trying to do so mm -hmm. um where do we need to pull back budget where do we need to increase budget just on a more of a i think a macro company level mm -hmm. um and i know we're going to get into a little bit more as far as how how um how that sort of translates itself into the CEO, into the marketing team. Um, it's a little bit of a different relationship as I'm thinking about more, what is the overall PL impact of our investment mm -hmm. versus sort of what is the, 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 the in-channel product selling Facebook versus Google impact of it all. Right, so you're taking a slightly more macro view, which, which, makes, which makes sense uh, given your role. Awesome. All right, so now that we know approximately and it seems to vary widely across brands and 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 different different levels and folks how much time folks are spending actually doing reporting and analyzing let's take a look at some of the challenges uh that marketers are facing in their ability to you know get good measurement and understand what's happening with their media so we asked this question to our our survey respondents which of the following challenges limit your ability to get useful insights from measurement now data just completely rained across all of the top responses that we had here, whether it was manual, uh, the manual nature of doing of managing data and reporting against it, the data fragmentation, you know, I can imagine if you're uh, a newer brand or an up and coming brand, and you're kind of diversifying your portfolio from two channels to three channels to four channels, and all of a sudden, you've got to be able to aggregate all that data. I can certainly imagine that's challenging. Um, data or metrics are inconsistent. So how can you effectively compare data uh, and results from one platform to another, for example? And then again, outdated data or um, you know, lack of trust in data, for example. Stephen, do any of these particular challenges uh, resonate with you or you know, represent areas you've been able to kind of find success or change your approach in how you kind of deal with, with data or challenges around measurement? Yeah, I would say like data fragmentation and inconsistent um, metrics across sources probably resonates the most with me. Um, I, I mean, it's probably like thinking about like performance from platform to platform or tactic to tactic. It's probably safe to say that like we've all been asked why we're not spending more money on brand search from someone outside of like the performance marketing space. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to consider when trying to equate performance from one platform to another, or even just tactic to tactic. And one piece that I think is key to understanding um, the performance is understanding how the content is consumed within the channel and where that user is at throughout the journey. And so at one end of the spectrum, you have something like Facebook prospecting users just living their life scrolling through the feed purchase intent is probably pretty low and you're trying to create some demand the scalability there is is pretty high and then on the other end of the spectrum you have something like brand search that user is specifically seeking out your brand and their purchase intent is for sure higher you're trying to capture demand that you created through some other tactic and the scalability there is low. So it's important to, to understand those pieces to try to equate some factor to balance out the performance of those. And the, the only way to like truly understand it is just 
continuing to test different mixes for your business and trying to figure out what works best. Awesome. Thanks, Stephen. That's great insight around, you know, not just looking so hard at the numbers all the time, but thinking about how is someone consuming this content and what could I expect from that level of intent or the scale that we're getting there. Great. Thanks. Any any other panelists have any notes on on these challenges? Nope. Okay. I, was just, I was just gonna say one thing to the lack oh. of trust in data. Um, I think there has to be a situation too where where uh, you know marketer CEOs. Uh, presence, they have to get together and agree on what the data is going to be, because there are different sources. I do think testing first-party data is great because it allows you to get a source of truth that you can all stand behind, but you also have to make sure the rest of your team stands behind it and that they understand this is a metric that is that is not consistent, that it always has to be tested. Because uh, sometimes I think people believe that, oh, you test something, okay, we're good. Why do we need a platform to keep testing? And you're like, you know, if things were the same all the time, like it would be much easier, but it's not. We live in a world that's constantly changing. So I think the lack of trust in the data, finding that data source that's accurate and then understanding that the data will always change and it has to continue to be tested. And I think automating the data so it's not manual is I think something we're all realizing there's a, there's a lot of new tools that have been created over the last couple of years or even you know within Tableau or different dashboards you can create. So I think we're all now in a quest to like reduce the manual work, mm -hmm. increase the amount of like strategy. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, whoever's out, you know, everyone just keep building those awesome tools so that people don't have to do manual <laughs> right. pulling anymore. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Stop organizing so you can start kind of analyzing uh, and getting down to the work. Yeah. Awesome. Great insight there. Um, and I think lastly, just the other thing to note here is that these are challenges that every marketer is facing. And I think that's, you know, you guys have given us some good tools and insights and strategies to, to help manage that and think about them. But I think it's important for folks to know that these are real challenges that a lot of marketers are experiencing right now um, and to continue to, to think about how to solve those in their day-to-day -day jobs. Awesome. We're going to jump right ahead to our next section on testing, testing and experimentation. Um, we talk a lot about this. We actually have a lot of a lot of content we've produced around this in other webinars. We're not going to spend too long in experiments today, but we did have a couple key points from our D2C research report that we wanted to make sure that we covered off on. Um, overall, marketers agree experiments are vital tools for measurement. This was perhaps one of the most um, kind of consistent answers we received across the entire report was that marketers recognize the value here, but what we did find, and you'll find more details in the report um, that go into methodology and types of experimentation and the rigor of those tests, a lot of questions around like, how do we do this? And how do we think about it? And how do I surpass some of the time and cost requirements um, to commit to testing? So I wanted to get a little bit of insight from the panel today on how you guys think about testing and your approach to testing. Um, Alex, maybe we'll start with you. You guys have a pretty rich history of running experiments. How do you decide what to test um, or how often do you guys think about testing uh, certain channels? Yeah, so I think new channels for sure, like if they get to some level of size. So I think if it's like 20,000 or 20, it's like nothing, you know, we'll just sort of let's, it's not worth everyone's time. I think it gets like some level of it makes the top, I don't know, the top 10, the top 12, like, okay let's let's go ahead and spend some time testing it mm -hmm. from a incrementality perspective mm -hmm. um and then i think the other the other thing too is like we've obviously continued to run tests on our bigger platforms but i think also um you know to your point like we now have within the measured the measured universe like a pretty robust amount of benchmarks that we can also look at and be like where do we compare what are we seeing versus them and i think you know your guys team does that too to help you know, where might there be an anomaly and, and there could be maybe an issue with the data or let's look at it because, you know, I think the more benchmarks we have, um, the better. Awesome. Thank you for that. And for those who may not know, uh, measured brands get access to a pool of data that kind of 
helps identify, okay, we've measured incrementality across all these different brands. And now you can look across that portfolio and see where you rank uh, in comparison to them. And I think that's a really good point too, because a lot of brands come into measured and they'll get full portfolio incrementality performance, and then they'll use benchmarks to identify, okay, how do I rank here? And then they'll also use those incrementality values to get insight into what should I test? Uh, you know, it, it does it look like there's a big opportunity here uh, to test into this channel or potentially scale into this particular um, tactic, for example. And, and caveat, I'm not a paid, uh, paid uh, I'm just a <laughs> happy customer. Yeah, I'm just a happy customer. Not sponsored, appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, not, not sponsored, hashtag. <laughs> um, well, we appreciate we appreciate you noting that, and we're excited that you're enjoying enjoying the tools. Um, Stephanie, uh, yeah. perspective from you on testing. I mean, you have a pretty rich history testing as well. And um, any, yeah. any thoughts or you know where where should someone start or how do they how do they even think yeah. about doing that? Yeah, I think I look at like our ad channel. You look at your ad channel budget percentages, right? Look at the biggest pieces of the pie, the ones you're spending the most money on, right? That's kind of to Alex's point. Like you want to start in the place where you're spending the most, right? Because you want to make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing in those channels. You want to make sure they're running as efficiently as possible. And then once you feel like you've got a good handle on it, start scheduling the time out to go. Well, what kind of seasonality do I have? How often do I want to keep testing this? Mm -hmm. uh, if you're a business that has a lot of seasonality, test it during the off season, in season, around the season, whatever you can do the more the better so like we'll test things maybe sometimes once every quarter or once every six months depending on the ad spend level or the seasonality of the business uh, and then we'll start looking at other channels that we want to grow into because if i have to start forecasting a certain amount of uh, forecast for next year that's twice as much as we have this year I got to start planning now. And so I got to start looking at those channels that we haven't been spending a lot in and see what happens when I start to scale those channels and, and how do they perform. And then it gives me as a marketer, I look at measured as just a tool in my toolbox. I don't look at it as measured telling me what my incrementality is. I look at it as a tool to allow me as a marketer to have what I need to be able to, with confidence, go back to my team and feel good about the decisions that I'm making uh, for moving forward. And then also knowing what kind of cadence that I should be continuing those tests for and why. Um, so that's the way I usually look at it kind of coming in. I think it's really, really important because you're leaving a lot on the table and it's it's giving us as marketers a lot of risk because no one has a, a crystal ball. If we, But we also have people expecting more from us from a predictability standpoint when we have so much less. And so this is basically what I call like a tool in our toolbox. I always say tests don't guess and this allows us to do that, so. Awesome, I might steal that line, tests don't guess, I like that. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, that's great insight. Um, all right, cruising right along because we'll want to get to the Q&A and I do want to mention uh, we have some questions rolling in on Slido. If you have any questions for the panel um, or, or about measured or channels in particular, et cetera, um, please go to slido.com. You can enter that code and then you can ask your question. You can also vote on other people's questions uh, who have listed some there already. All right, and our last uh, section here that we're gonna talk about is optimization. Um, really big topic for us. You, so you've understood, okay, where am I spending my money? How is it performing? But how do you decide what to do next? How do you decide where to allocate dollars um, and how to make your next move? We're gonna start with our last poll to the audience. Please jump on Slido again. And this is our, our final poll today. How often do you typically move budget across channels? And we asked this question because um, not just in channel. I think I think a lot of times we think about optimizing within channel, um, but really moving budgets from one channel to the other. And it's interesting because we really do see a variety of answers here from from our brands in particular. Um, but it looks like here so far, weekly really coming in. Uh, we have a pretty pretty tactile group uh, on the webinar today, which is great. Give it another second or there, uh, weekly, monthly, quarterly. Great. All right, um, panel, I'm gonna turn this over to you guys. Stephanie, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about your allocation uh, cadence. How do you guys think about budget and, and moving it across channels? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to have a budget. That's the first thing you start with. Let's have a, an ad budget that you have in mind for like a specific month. But I think when it comes to allocating that budget, I think for us, I kind of agree with the audience. If we're kind of doing who wants to be a millionaire, I agree with the audience. Um, weekly, it's typically what I usually do when it comes to moving across channels, depending on performance. So if we see for some reason that we're a little below budget, we're like, well, what can we do? You know, we may want to move some more money around into certain areas. So that happens weekly. Um, 
then I would say when it comes to changing things within the platform, that's typically done obviously daily. So I kind of look at it as like daily changes in platform, weekly chat uh, between platforms. And then for some reason, if you are just killing it, typically you can increase your budget. <laughs> so if you know that you're gonna exceed it, I think increasing budget is okay just because you have a static budget for the month. Going over is a good thing if you're hitting your efficiency. Awesome, thanks, Stephanie. Alex, um, any comments on cadence? Do you guys feel like you that's changed at all over the course of you know Faraday's um, growth in marketing? And then uh, lastly, wanted to ask you if you had any particular metrics that you guys focus on or think about in your business. Um, so on the first on the first point, you know the answer is it used to be a lot more often. Mm -hmm. So I think it used to be, you know, daily, weekly, let's, let's just, you know, I think specifically when Facebook and Instagram was a bigger part of our overall budget, um, we, we definitely jacked things up more so than not when we were seeing an ad set perform well. That's definitely changed um, now that we're more diverse. And I think a lot of our channels just have a longer lead time, you know, anything from a catalog to a... Uh, even CTV to podcast to radio, like you sort of have a set budget that you can't really change on a monthly basis. So you're kind of locked into what you got to do. So your Google and your Facebook becomes the most easy to pull. And, and honestly, like performance is becoming more and more consistent across those channels. Maybe that's as we've gotten bigger, or maybe that's just, I think, as the platforms have matured, there's not as much volatility. So we're definitely a monthly um, as far as how we move budgets around, we're probably a quarterly as far as like how we really move budgets around. And we're probably yearly as far as like, what are big new channels we want to get into and get really good at? We'll kind of always have that bucket going into a year of like, what do we want to test and just see what we're good at and see what we can figure out. Um, and then I think on the second, your second question around how do we think about the business kind of goes back to my earlier statement around as the CEO, I think of things a little bit more macro. So to me, as we're spending money in 20 different marketing channels uh, across offline, online, top of funnel, lower funnel, right? It ends up coming down to like, what percentage of, of revenue, what, what, what percentage of marketing as a percentage of revenue are we actually spending? Mm -hmm. So in-channel can look great, um, platform can look great, uh, attribution can look great, but in the end of the day, like the proof is in how much revenue we're generating as a percentage of the marketing that we're spending. So a little bit old school mentality to how you know, marketing was thought of is sort of like that balance between the new school, which is like, let's get very granular with the, the digital marketing data and understand where we're winning and where we're not. And then, okay, how much am I spending a, as a percentage of my sales on marketing, on performance marketing? And, and does that all align up to that's actually working? Because obviously the more effective my marketing is, I should be spending less revenue, less marketing as a percentage of my revenue. Got it. So increasing efficiency overall for the business and making sure that you're driving revenue with the in the, is in one simple number. How much okay. performance marketing are you spending? How much revenue are you generating? Right. Great insight. And the lower that percentage comes, the better the cash flow and the profitability of the business is. And the more you can invest in in, I don't know, more brand moments, probably. That's awesome. I was going to say, you could tell you're a CEO because you talk exactly, <laughs> that's totally a CEO perspective. And I love that because it's so true though. Like you have to, I think the CEOs are always looking for how can we make sure that we have a healthy spend, our, our marketing efficiency ratio. Um, and I think also certain companies will also focus on your, like I call it like AMR, like attribution mark. You have people who are constantly coming back. You want to know like what your churn rates are. You want to know like your return customers. You want to understand like, you know, the cost to acquire those customers. And it all kind of like just feeds together and how to communicate to those audiences differently. Um, and then I've also worked for brands where there really wasn't a lot of repeat customers and it was really difficult. And then you kind of hit that flat line, right? Where you're just like, okay, how do we become more like how, how do we do more with where we are now and it's either you expand out internationally you start selling more product but it all comes down to trying to be as efficient as you can and hitting hitting the targets um so it's just it's it's just interesting seeing it from different perspectives so and i think also you realize um there's so many digital marketing channels to invest in and there's always something new and there's always something that people are talking about and i think we've also the realization is like you know, you just can't do too many channels well. So there's definitely like, you got to focus and you got to make sure that you're really good at those, at, you know, enough, you know, whatever, five channels that drive 
70% of it and like actually spend time on those channels because what happens is you end up spending like too much time on the channels that don't really drive any business and it kind of kind of can become a, a waste of people's time. So yeah. I think that's important. I think we went through this whole craze of more channels, more channels, more channels. I think we're like, okay, what can we actually do well? I think the last piece too on just optimizations is we obviously test a lot of channels and I have this in, in belief that um, every channel can be very, very optimized if you spend the time on it. So like the creative plan is so important to like thinking of things as a marketer, like why does someone see this ad and want to buy something like versus like just churning out ads and ads just to like have fresh stuff. So it's like really taking that step back, like putting your marketer's hat on, like what yeah. the fuck is this channel's purpose and why <laughs> am I advertising on it? And right. simplifying everything a little bit, um, I think is, is we're all in the digital marketing world, like yeah. moving a little bit towards that because the last couple of years, obviously 20 and 21 were just bonanzas and like anything, anywhere you could spend money, it seemed like it was working and we're moving into the new world of like back to the old world of like, it's actually really hard to make money on marketing and you gotta be really good at it and really smart at how you spend it. It's like putting a quarter in a dollar machine. I always tell people, I was like, you can't spend, you can't have a million different places to spend because we don't, we only have so much time to focus on the channels we have and perfect and, them. And, and then we? what channels are good for what? So right. like catalog is good for us. Like we figured out catalog for us is really good for like a specific purpose. Like it's great for retention. It's great for new customers that come in on Facebook and Instagram. It's not amazing for just throwing, throwing a bunch of catalogs against the wall and hoping they stick. Like <laughs> Facebook and Instagram and Google are a way more efficient way of doing it um, than that. Because to Stephen's point, the audience and the scale is just amazing that you can get out of those channels. Um, and then obviously TV is amazing because like the eyeballs you get on like, especially with CTV on important moments of American culture without these huge swings that you have to make on network TV. Like, you know, I see viewers doing an amazing job during my, uh, my, M my Yankees playoff run of, of being there. And like, that was awesome. I watch everything on streaming. So, you know, I think there's where you can show up in these big, important cultural moments without having to like totally take these huge risks is what CTV is amazing for. Totally. That's awesome. Steven, anything to add there or kind of resonate? Uh, I think, yeah, I think they covered it. Pretty well. We we look at the business in a really similar similar way to Alex. Um, and I would say like in terms of how often we're making optimizations, it just comes down to the performance. Like we we sometimes are making changes weekly. At, at other times, it might be monthly, just depending on what's going on at any given time. But yeah, we we call our our metric a cost, just ad spend as a percent of revenue, and mm -hmm. get granular and other perspectives but uh, at the end of the day that's what ultimately like drives success awesome and it gets it gets more complicated too as you start having more offline business like mm -hmm. we have a wholesale business a physical retail business like how much do you allocate of your performance marketing to those channels because if you give them all if you pound your e-commerce PL with all of it like that's not fair so um yeah we're, we're it's uh it's not easy so thanks uh yeah, thanks for having measured. That definitely helps us. Happy to be here uh, and happy to partner with you guys. Awesome. Well, uh, we do have some questions pouring into Slido. Uh, very exciting. Uh, if you don't have a question, you can still vote on other questions in Slido um, in the ranking system. Before we do, just a few takeaways here. One, you know, you're not alone. Uh, a lot of the challenges that marketers face, we seem to find were common across other marketers. Um, and the industry as a whole is continuing to feel impacts such as new data regulations that are continuing to impact media measurement capabilities. That being said, methodology matters as we were able to just reveal um, in our chart there, the difference between a platform ROAS and an incremental ROAS can vary widely. So it's important to make sure you're making business decisions on accurate data uh, that really helps reveal the true causal impact of your advertising on your conversions. And lastly, always be testing uh, a mantra here at Measured, but just really always be continuing to ask the questions and evaluating, is this channel working for me? Um, where can I optimize and where can I reallocate? 
I would say the fifth uh, takeaway here uh, that I heard a lot through this panel was really thinking about the content and uh, just the user experience and, and where that person is absorbing your content and your objective to doing so, whether it's like Alex mentioning being a part of cultural moments or as Stephen, you know, highlighting if someone's scrolling in the feed, they're going to be perceiving, um, you know, your particular content differently than someone who's ready to purchase uh, making a brand search query on Google. Awesome. Well, let's jump into Q&A. Uh, Terrence, what do we have so far in Slido? Any good questions for the panel uh, that you'd like to ask? Uh, I have. I see a couple of votes coming in. We have a few with a, with uh, a few re. Let's call it not retweets, but uh, let's say requests. So the first one is a good one. It's a it's around publisher um, slash vendor uh, testing. How do we account for differences in increment te incrementality testing methodologies like intent to treat ghost ads uh, or PSAs or other things? Mm -hmm. um, you know, at a, at a high level, I can I can take that one. So sure. geo testing is what we um, is obviously what we base all our methodology in because it is the most robust to changing marketplace dynamics. Meaning that because we're using customers' actual source of truth transaction data, like their money hitting the bank, as the outcome in those tests. It's, it's fairly impervious to changes in tracking, changes in visibility, addressability, and things like that. All of those other methodologies, which rely on being able to see someone on the internet, have their own inherent biases, which also change over time. I'll give you a, a quick example for one of them is PSA testing. Mm. When, when we had long tail windows, like 28 day view through windows available on various social platforms, PSA testing was, was great because you could actually track a user's conversions even if they had not seen an ad for a pretty long amount of time to, to where you could get enough volume to get a substantial read. If you only have seven days to see if someone's converting or not, like we do now on most social platforms, PSA testing is not gonna give you enough signal to get a statistically significant read that you would trust. So the answer to that, and I, I won't go into each one, but all of those have their own inherent biases. Geo testing mm -hmm. is the only one that's basically impervious to all the, the, the market dynamics that we discussed here. Great. That's great insight and great question. Thank you for that. I do see a question that's kind of jumping to the top here. Um, are the brands running other types of measurement studies, uh, MMM um, or MTA alongside incrementality, or have they selected incrementality as their preferred uh, form of measurement? Stephanie, I don't know if you want to take a stab at that one. Are you guys, you know, historically using other forms of measurement as well, or typically utilizing incrementality measurement um, for your for your testing? Yeah, I think just because I always like to see other perspectives, um, we have used other tools um, in the past, um, but I typically look at measured as my my baseline for truth, right? So I'll say, this is what I'm seeing here. This is what I'm seeing there. They're very similar, but in this area, I'm not seeing that. So we are an outlier here. So it just helps to validate some of the things I am seeing, but I don't look at the other uh, software tools that I do use as my source of truth. I just use it like as a secondary balance of like, okay, this is what I'm seeing and measured. This is what I'm seeing in that platform. This is what I'm seeing. You know, So it just gives me a little bit more uh, trust and knowing that I can come back and let them know that this is this is what I'm seeing across the board. Everything makes sense, but this is one area where I'm not seeing things. So I think it's something that we need to test. Um, and so that's that's the only reason why I typically use two systems. Otherwise, if I had to only use one, I'd probably just be using the measured tool. Awesome. Thanks for that. Terrence, I see a good one on, did I see a good one on TikTok there? I know that's a hot topic. Do we want to highlight that one? Yeah, I, I'd be actually interested to hear some of the panelists as well, um, but I can share a quick insight just across some of the brands we've worked with. Basically, TikTok's ad product is a lot less mature than some of its competitors being Snap and Facebook. I think we all know that. We also know that, you know, they have a very different audience and, and a, a, a place that you can, you can achieve things on TikTok that you can't achieve other places. So it's certainly still a high priority for people trying to hit that demographic. It's just that their, their ad tech and their ad product hasn't been up to standards for a while. We're seeing that improve slowly but surely. Very recently, I would say I've seen a lot of good results there and a lot of good performance. Similar to other kind of um, call it top funnel channels, it generally takes quite a lot of spend to get good signal there and for the algo to really work its magic. It's very mm -hmm. similar to YouTube in that way. If you spend a little bit in YouTube or you dip your toes in, it doesn't tend to work very well. But if you if you give a lot of velocity and a lot of light into those algorithms to be able to optimize, they we are seeing good performance there in a lot of places. So in short. It's probably still lagging behind its competitors, but it is growing in, in budget share and then growing in performance. Um, but yeah, I'll throw that to the panel if any of you guys have had recent TikTok experience. 
Yeah, the question was, have you seen, uh, you know, a lot of success on TikTok so far? And how would you kind of approach that um, for other marketers who are, you know, it's clearly a hot channel and a hot topic. Um, any panelists have any insight there? I was going to say my only my only um, thing I want to add to that because I do think that yes, TikTok we we've done a lot of beta testing with them and a lot of their different a lot of different things with shopping with them when they started with some of these things. But you know I think from a measurement standpoint, it's still very uh, it was still very shaky for us. But I would say from a creative standpoint, um, I think brands have to kind of change the way that they're doing things to get TikTok right. And I think once they can figure that out, they can do amazing things. I work for brands more organically that like TikTok has just been a huge revenue, so like a huge just traffic source for them to get like their name out there from a branding standpoint at little to no cost. And then they can take that those learnings and figure out, hey, maybe we can create ads with this and get even more learning. And so uh, I think it depends on how you're using it. I don't think we're using it as a main revenue driver, but it's caught it for, for, for Ocean specifically, I think it helps to get a lot of attention to what's happening in the world and, and bringing um, a lot of eyeballs to the mission. So I think that's what's really important for us about TikTok at the moment. Uh, I do think eventually they will get better. Um, but I do think it's one thing that brands have to realize is that our video now versus with the way video used to be even five years ago has dramatically changed and it has to be changed to kind of help, um, uh, I think to help when it comes to like just the click through rate and conversions on TikTok in general. Awesome. Yeah, one, one thing, one thing I'd add there, like you should, you should approach TikTok like you would approach any other new channel and that you need to create content that's native for the platform. Don't, don't expect to like copy and paste something from Facebook or any other channel and it work. If if you're not seeing success there, it's it's probably that you're just running the wrong content. Like people go to TikTok to be entertained. And and so I would say just invest in, you know, somebody to run the channel who understands it. Like you can hire people that have a decent TikTok following and create their own videos, you know. So like it's, it's just really important to understand how users consume the content mm. in addition to like everything else you're doing with optimization across platform and tactic and whatnot. Awesome. Um, we're at time. I had one last question I wanted to sneak in for a quick answer uh, to the panel. Um, how long should you test a channel before deciding it's not a good fit? So do you guys have any experience in any channels that you've maybe tested or looked at or evaluated and turned away from over time? I know, Alex, you mentioned consolidating, you know, in recent years, is that around any particular channel or, or, or any thoughts there on like, you know, continue to invest in channels and make them work? There's definitely bottom performers that you weed out on a monthly basis. I think there's, uh, I don't think we have like a set, this is the dollar spend we're going to spend on it. But I think there's, you know, there's a look back where we're like, all right, can we get really good at this channel? What is it going to take? Like, do we have the, the muscle if it's going to be something totally new and different, like maybe it's not worth the effort. Um, does it feel like it's working? And that's obviously the numbers. And then some of that's just in like anecdotal feedback from my, from our post-purchase surveys. Um, is it actually working? So I think mm -hmm. we're also looking at post-purchase surveys a lot to see what the data might not be telling us. Um, and I think Stephanie brought up a good point. Like there's also some platforms like are under measuring what's actually working. So you got to give it a little bit of time. Um, but I think we're constantly weeding out what's working. And then, as I said, let's do less mm -hmm. and let's do more with less. Awesome. Great insight. All right. I know we're at time. Lots of questions. We will uh, do a follow-up email to those who registered uh, with some additional information. Um, first, I just wanted to say thank you to our wonderful panel and speakers Alex, Stephanie, Stephen, thank you guys so much for being here and answering questions and providing your insight. Really appreciate it. Um, for anyone watching who's interested in more resources, you can go to measure.com slash resources. And we have other webinars uh, on specific topics from the past, case studies, measurement guides, and the like. All right. I think that concludes our webinar today on the state of marketing attribution and measurement. Thank you guys again and hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, guys. Thanks, all.